Hello and welcome back to the Now We Know show, the show where we discuss a topic of interest and by the end we will have learned something new and hopefully you will too. I'm Zach. And I'm Buzz. And I'm Jack. And today's podcast is going to be a little bit different because Jack has actually pre-recorded his segment of the podcast because he couldn't be here with the rest of us to record the rest of it. Oh, Oh, what a shame. But at least we get to hear him. Exactly, that's the point. That's and he's, he's put his six penny worth in on this one. Huzzah. So as always, we will kick off with Word of the Week, followed by some amazing feedback to our Devonshire Folklore episode from one of our favourite regular listeners, Roxy in Devon. Then we will have our Now We Know show flashback, leading into our main segment all about secret societies. Well done, by the way, if you guessed the topic from the teaser in our previous episode. We will then round up with the answer to the Word of the Week and then a new teaser for our next episode. Sounds a plan. Let's do it. Secret Societies. Here we come. If you enjoy the Now We Know Show podcast, why not support Zach World Productions on our Patreon page? Become an official ZWP patron for as little as £1 a month for exclusive early access to all our latest episodes, videos, behind the scenes, updates and more. So I did mention that we had some feedback from one of our listeners. You certainly did. And this was a response to our Devonshire Folklore episode. Mm -hmm. And this was Roxy who actually inspired us to do that episode. Yes, Roxy's name is starting to come up more regular. (laughs) It's good to have regular listeners. So Roxy said... Hi, Roxy. Just listen to Devonshire Folklore 1... It was brilliant. I was walking the dog around the road laughing out loud. People probably thought I was a nutter. I love how Zach is trying to keep things on track and Pete and Jack are just besides themselves. There's lots of emojis here. Excellent episode. Thank you for doing it. You know you guys are welcome down here anytime to go exploring. You might have to give Post Bridge a wide berth, though. Ha ha ha. Well, I think we may well take Roxy up on her offer and take her travel down there at some point. Oh, definitely. We'll have to do a podcast with Roxy. But, you know, I kind of like feel as if I, I kind of do want to go to this strange area, but I don't want to. I don't want to come into. I forget uh, some video evidence. Yeah, I know. I don't. That'd be I, nice. Yeah, what of the hairy hands? Yeah. I was going to say I don't necessarily know if I want to meet the hairy hands or not. I mean, what was the hairy hands? And there was that kind of spectral horse, wasn't there? Yes. Uh, can't think of the chap's name now. Crocken. Oh, old Crocken. Old Crocken. There we go. Or Kraken. Or Kraken. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, on to our Word of the Week. Okay, word. Zach, what is the Word of the Week? we got to do the thing. Oh, sorry. That's fine. Word, word of the, the week. week. Word of the 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 Week. So Word of the Week is all about old English words we don't use anymore. All you have to do is write down what you think it means in the comments. We will then reveal what it means at the end of the episode so you can find out if you got it right. So, I already have what Jack thinks the Word okay. of the Week is. Okay. But for you, Buzz, it's my turn. the Word of the Week is... Come on, what is it? What is it? Hugger mugger. <laughs> what? What a mugger? Hugger mugger. Hugger mugger. So it's spelt H-U-G-G-E-R hyphen... M U G G E R. Hugger mugger. Hugger mugger. Sounds like somebody who gives you a hug and picks your pockets. Mm, it's interesting, interesting. <laughs> That's not too far from what Jack said. Hugger mugger. Hugger mugger. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm obviously going to find out at the end of the You're episode. You're going to find out at the end of the episode. Uh, somebody who sells you dodgy goods. <laughs> a hugger mugger. Well, keep it, keep it to yourself. We'll find out at the end of the episode. Well, I can't keep it to myself. I've said it. So there you go. That's <laughs> okay, what, fair enough. Fair enough. So, before we get into secret societies, I want you to first cast your mind back to the very first episode of the Now We Know Show podcast. Gosh, that was sometime last year. And for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. Was it a taste test? It was about the flat earth. Oh, gosh, the flat (laughs) earth. Now, that's going to come up in, a, in an episode about secret society, surely. Now, now, in the end of that episode, we did say that we should do an episode on secret societies. We did. And now, 35 episodes later, later, we've finally got around to day. doing it. Yay! <laughs> Bizarre. So, for this episode, we have each taken one secret society. We've done yes. a bit of research on it. Yes. I think, uh, basically, we were just, uh, amongst ourselves, chose which secret society we, sh- we wish to cover, and... Uh, Thankfully, we didn't choose the same ones. Okay, so I think you, Buzz, have chosen a fairly big one. I have. So I think I, I went in there big stuff. Yeah, I think we should start off this this podcast mm-hmm. with you going into that. Right now, I thought, well, if we're talk, talking about secret societies, 
there is one secret society that immediately springs to mind. For me anyway. And yeah. it's, it's, can you guess? No, I'll tell you. It's the Illuminati. Do, 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 do. Is that exactly. the sound? They make sounds? They don't. Uh, the Illuminati. I mean, the Illuminati. It's probably the most well-known. It's very prolific, isn't of it? The secret societies. So I decided to look at the subject of the Illuminati, which, by the way, simply means the enlightened. Oh. Or the enlightened. That doesn't ones. seem particularly threatening. <laughs> well, there we go. So let's find out. Frankly, it's the conspiracy theory to dwarf all conspiracy theories when it comes to um, secret societies. It's a smorgasbord of every other intrigue under the sun. The Illuminati are the supposed overlords controlling the world's affairs, operating secretly as they seek to establish a new world order. Mm. Uh, you've probably heard uh, about authors such as Dan Brown, who's written about them in his books. Uh, the Illuminati have featured in movies such as Tomb Raider and probably yeah, many, many yeah. others. And uh, this most secret of societies is also featured in popular video games as well. Oh, definitely, in several. Uh, so, you know, you've got this uh, underlying trend that people love to bring up. The Illuminati has been... Yeah, so this is kind of like presented this ancient kind yeah, of society, they, they, this they cult. Are, they are the ones... That are, that are in charge of everything. In charge of everything. Behind everything is the Illuminati. So when most people try to look into the secret society's history, they actually find themselves in Germany. Ooh. And it's with the Enlightenment era order of the Illuminati. It was a Bavarian secret society founded in 1776. The society was for intellectuals to privately group together and oppose religious and elitist influences over everyday life. It included several well-known progressives at the time, but along with the Freemasons, they found themselves gradually outlawed by conservative and Christian critics, and the group faded out of existence. Or did they? <laughs> anyway, but today, today there are several groups that use the name Illuminati. A quick Google search, which I did, uh, we'll find one such as Illuminati Official Online. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a Facebook group or something? No, no, these are websites. Oh, are oh websites. okay. Uh, the Illuminati, oh, sorry, the Illuminatium Club. Right. And the Illuminati Mason Order. So, I mean... Uh, there's probably many more. We're saying there. this, but... That's not very secret for a secret society, is it? Oh, well, that's kind of the thing. You know, I thought, okay, let's just do a, a Google search. And I came up immediately. And, and if you look at their websites, you know, they have got the, you know, the pyramid that is always... Yeah, with the yeah, eye. Yeah, with the all-seeing eye, which is all, also... And it's there. Some of them have, uh, you know, actual, like, uh, moving graphics of it spinning around <laughs> and things like this. And it's like, they, they... I didn't go into too much of the excuse me, diatribe of what they say on the websites, but it's all about, you know, becoming, you know, part of the society and being your know, in with the now what what I don't know. It's are all, there all membership the bonuses or something? What, <laughs> what what is the incentive? I they all seem a bit cultist. Mm. I mean, obviously somebody who might be listening to this who's from one of the three that I mentioned might want to take issue with that. By all means, you know, you, they can comment or contact us if they if they like. But on initial look, it was as if people have taken the name of the Illuminati and using it as a standard to try and make their secret society you know, be a member of our secret society. If you see right. what I mean. But I don't think that these are really anything to do with the... With an ancient Illuminati. cult. It's just exactly. kind of like they've adopted the name. Exactly. So, so where did the modern day... <laughs> this is the thing. So what I wanted to find out was where did this modern day fascination with the Illuminati come from? Especially considering it obviously seems to stem from the... Uh, German Illuminati, or should I say Bavarian Illuminati, that was originally founded in 1776. Well, as far as I can find out, this far-fetched paranoia all started with a playful work of fiction in the 1960s. The Illuminati that we've come to hear about today is hardly influenced by the Bavarian Illuminati at all. Instead, it's really based on an era of countercultural mania, LSD, and an interest in Eastern philosophy, uh, which is largely responsible for the group's totally unsubstantiated modern incarnation. It all began somewhere amid the summer of love and the hippie phenomenon when a small printed text emerged that's called the Principia, or Principia, Discordia. What? So this is from the 1960s? 1960s. That's not very ancient. <laughs> no. So the book, in a nutshell, is a parody text of a parody faith. And that parody faith is called 
Discordianism and it's conjured up by enthusiastic anarchists and thinkers to bid its readers to worship Eris, goddess of chaos. The Discordian movement was ultimately a collective that wished to cause civil disobedience, practical jokes and hoaxes. The, the, I know. <laughs> what? Exactly. This is completely like different to what I imagined the Illuminati to actually be. Well, let me continue. The text itself never amounted to anything more than a countercultural uh, curiosity. But one of the tenets of the faith is that such miscreant activities can bring about social change and force individuals to question the parameters of reality. <laughs> According to the book Principia Discordia, the world was becoming too authoritarian, too tight, too closed and too controlled during the 60s. They wanted to bring chaos back into society and shake things up. And the way to do that is to spread disinformation, to disseminate misinformation through all portals, through counterculture, through mainstream media, through mm. whatever means. And they decided that they would do that initially by telling stories about the Illuminati. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, so... In, so up until yeah, this interesting. point, the Illuminati... Okay, so to summarise what I've already said, the Illuminati seems to have originated in Bavaria. Yeah. Um, which in itself was a society of intellectuals to kind of like go against what they felt was becoming, you know, they didn't like the Christian attitudes and things, you know. Yeah, they wanted that, to rebel, yeah. They wanted to rebel, but they got squished, basically. Um, and then... <laughs> never really came to anything came to anything until the 1960s when you suddenly get this following for um you know the the principia discordia uh, works on this uh, kind of let's be rebellious <laughs> and in order to do that they start up talking about and using the word or the term illuminate <laughs> to start mixing things up <laughs> Now, at this time, a writer called Wilson worked for a men's magazine called Playboy, which I'm sure oh, no. most people have heard of. <laughs> oh, no. And he and another writer called Thornley started sending in fake letters from readers, right, talking about this secret elite organisation called the Illuminati. <laughs> 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 then, <laughs> then they would send in more letters to contradict the letters they'd just written. Oh, no, this is becoming <laughs> so convoluted. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> and so, as I've said, the Illuminati has become the conspiracy theory to dwarf all conspiracy theories, controlling the world's affairs, operating secretly as they seek to establish a new world order. And the current biggest conspiracy theory, the Great Reset. <laughs> That's something for another podcast. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So, let's go on. Uh, the concept behind all of this is if you give enough contrary points of view on a story, in theory, idealistically, the population at large start looking at these things and think, hang on a minute. They ask themselves, can I trust how the information is being presented to me? Oh, no, this is, we heard this? <laughs> oh, no, this is tying back into our first episode of The Flat Earth. <laughs> Well, exactly. So it's an idealistic means of getting people to wake up to the suggested realities they inhabit. However, like the flat earth theory, <laughs> as you just mentioned, even though we know we live on a sphere orbiting our closest star, the sun, there is so much discord caused by it that there are still people out there that believe the flat earth is the reality oh, no. that will open your eyes to the hidden realities that we're all blinking so, to. So it's actually the Illuminati that are presenting this to kind of establish this kind of false information that people latch onto to kind of think that the earth is actually flat. Yes, <laughs> but it goes further than that because if you think of the, uh, I mean, obviously back in the 60s, um, you didn't have the internet. You no, didn't have very true. social media in the, that way. So, you know, I've already spoken about those two writers that were writing, writing letters in, and people used to always go to magazines or go to newspapers and read the letters from the readers sections mm. and so if you're throwing things in there and people are coming out with goofy ideas then it, even if the people that are writing the publication know that what they're writing is uh, a far extreme idea about something so yeah. like take for example oh i mean come on we don't need to really well we'll only gloss over it but you just touch upon the pandemic right. where the pandemic came from uh, what about the vaccines? What you know, the good or bad points points of the vaccine? So if you've got people that are actually making a point of writing misinformation, misinformation, and then themselves then writing to argue against that disinformation, it just it creates confusion, doesn't it? Makes confusion in the general public, who then 
pick up on all this stuff and they themselves find that they're getting they end up developing a belief in something that yeah. actually never existed in the first yeah, place and, it, and it's creating that sense of chaos and anarchy isn't which it which then reaps itself against you know the, i wouldn't say reaps the rewards but it, 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 it then makes everybody else's job much harder much harder you know when you have to deal with well, that's these things. a really interesting perspective to kind of have on it that it's kind of all this misinformation is the act of giving this misinformation yeah. and is causing the confusion and that is the result of this mm-hmm. misinformation wow you know and uh, and again because i think it was in the flat earth podcast that we did we the masons get th- kept getting thrown yeah out. see yeah. i i almost went for the masons on this one but i thought i'd stick with the, the big one the illuminati yeah but the Masons, you know, because... Um, and the Masonic Lodges the and Masonic all that. Masonic Lodges. And there's lots of other type of Mason-like Masonic Lodges around. And, of course, as soon as you've got that idea of closed doors and people not knowing what's going behind the, those closed doors, and people will always think that there's people that are in control and controlling everything. And, then, and of course, this leads on to the Great Reset, which is the biggest one these days, and we'll talk about It's interesting, that. the parallels I'm noticing, because I've obviously already had the conversation with Jack about right. his secret society. Okay. Well, not specifically his, but the one he covered mm-hmm. in his segment. So it's interesting, the parallels. Yeah, so anyway, um, and again, just a little thing that came up in my research was also there was an Illuminati role-playing card game which appeared in 1975, <laughs> uh, which imprinted its mystical world of secret societies onto a whole new generation. You know, so people are, I mean, just like people play Dungeons and Dragons, I suppose, these days, and Hero Quest. Oh, yes. We'll have in. to do something on um, Hero Quest. But if you're suddenly presented with the idea of secret societies and you've got the, your role playing secret societies, then it can kind of get into the human psyche. That, well, it's, it's that, like. They must be a It's thing. like films and things. People get so caught up on the fictional world and universes that are presented within movies Mm -hmm. and you just have to take a step back and actually realize that this is just fictitious it's It's, it's been made to be entertaining yes now today it's one of the world's most widely punted conspiracy theories as i said and even celebrities like jay-z and beyonce have taken on the symbolism of the illuminati themselves raising their hands in the illuminati triangle at concerts (laughs) Which instead of instigating mind-blowing, a uh, um, type of mind-blowing epiphany for everyone, it has caused the realization that actually it's all fake. Because <laughs> you know these are pop stars that are just doing these kind of like, oh yeah, we'll we'll do this. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that does sort of kind of detract from the kind of it, mysticism it, there, doesn't it? Uh, which, funnily enough, is not what the proponents of discordianism back in the 60s had originally intended, <laughs> of course, because their idea of causing social uh, disorder, mm. you know. Um, has now become kind of like a trendy, symbol, a trendy thing, trendy symbol. You know, it's completely blurred out what the original intention <laughs> yeah. was. Um, but as I say, we live in a world that is full of conspiracy theories, and more importantly, conspiracy theory believers. Mm. So there are groups that, have, as I say, that have taken up the name of the Illuminati. But it would seem the Illuminati, in the context of the secret society that is controlling and manipulating the, the you know, everything behind the scenes. It simply doesn't exist. Or do they? <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. So, that, was, that was good, that was good. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's the thing. I, I dare say, um, when you've got... I mean, obviously, we're talking about the Illuminati, and yeah. it would seem, however far you dig on it, it's just... Uh, it never results in anything, does it? So, rather than being an actual thing, thing it's more of just an idea. Right. That people play upon. Yeah. 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 Uh, and people will manipulate other people by putting out this disinformation. Well, isn't that the thing? Now, we've with the internet, mm-hmm. social media, films, whatever, we are living in the age of disinformation. Oh, gosh, aren't we? The, yeah. the filters, there are no filters. Yeah. But sure, that people but that's can... The, that's the problem. I, I mean, you adjust know... Adjust things, but... When you have some disinformation, which literally can be proven to be completely wrong mm. complete brothers there's no doubt about it yeah you take i know we keep harking on about the flat earth but you sit somebody in a space rocket take them up above the atmosphere take them to the international space station i don't know a few years time we'll be watching the uh, l- new lunar landings on the moon and things mm-hmm. if you can physically take somebody and show them 
this is this is real. It's, it's yeah. not CGI. It's not filmed by NASA. It's not made up by the Masons. It's real. They will not believe you because some people are so set in their ways, their minds are now locked into that disinformation. Mm. That disinformation is their truth. And you, you know, to, to try and then get twi- you know, change it and to say, no, hang on a minute, I've now got to face the fact that I've been... You've got to reevaluate I've, your entire life. Life, because for years I have been following this you know, Just because thing. somebody has addressed it for five minutes mm-hmm. in a conversation... No way, you're never going to change. You know, you're going to say, no, that's it, I'm sticking to my ways, because if I don't, then it means everything that I've done... Is pointless. Is pointless. Yeah. You know, and that can be attributed to, um, you know, sometimes, you know, people's beliefs and things. Obviously, we have to be open to allow people to have their different beliefs. You of know? course. Um, but if, if one person's God, or gods, yeah. are the god or gods surely that means everybody else's it's must wrong. be wrong yeah there's that mentality <laughs> so, you know so when it comes to that beliefs whether you're believing about uh some kind of celestial godhead or whether you're thinking the earth is flat or whether you feel that there is a society behind the scenes that are controlling everything yeah. did the moon do, landings happen you know, type of effort. if you've if you once you've taken once you've gone down that rabbit hole it's very hard to come out to come back out of yeah. that again, and of course, then those people will say, "You are the sheep." Yeah, you are the ones. You're following the trend. Once you realise the earth is flat, that will open your, open mind, your mind to yeah. that enlightenment. Um, but the Illuminati is just an idea. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that there are not groups of people that are in very privileged positions that do not control certain aspects of financial life you know government life you know there it's inevitable that when you get human beings together especially if you get people that uh, maybe they're very rich ultra rich super rich they're going to befriend each other they're going to have their cliques just like being no different from being at school where you have the clique, cliques there where you have you know the the the, the you know, people separate you've got you've got uh, the sport guys you've got the yeah, um, the, st- the stereotypes. You, you the stereotype. You're going to get that throughout life. It doesn't matter whether you're a kid or whether you're an adult. If you are go- revolving in certain social circles, yeah, then that's inevitable. It's theorizing what's. If you're in a specific group, it's yep. theorizing what are the other people talking about. Yes. What are and, they doing? And of course, if you if you classify yourself as I'm the working class person, yeah, then it's very easy to think that the upper class people or the super rich people must be controlling things and maybe to the point of they're keeping me they're keeping us down yeah yeah you that know? idea of oppression a kind, of, kind of oppression and that leads into all sorts of different social structures whether you think that uh, you know if you say you're somebody who uh, is definitely a capitalist or whether you're somebody who is bent on socialism or somebody who wants to be involved in um uh, communism. Well, yeah, when you look at some, you know countries where they have a different uh, uh, political regime, mm. maybe a com- communist society, yep. uh, then you feel that the the governments there control the people mm. and don't allow them information or supply them with disinformation. Take North Korea for example. You know, North Korea has invented absolutely everything. They've invented space travel. They've invented you know microwaves, com- microwave computers. Yeah, you know, in fact, the leader has done all, done all that. Um, yeah, so disinformation spreads things. I think at the current position we're in with the Ukraine, the amount of disinformation that the Russian public are being told yeah. compared to the information yeah, that it's the Western... It's kind of scary sometimes. You know, and it, you li- hear the things that are creeping out of Russia and then you hear, you see interviews with Russians on the streets that are so set, set that they're believing 100% everything. That and, and this is just obviously some... Uh, percentage of the public because there's a lot of the Russian public which are dead set against everything that's occurring at the moment with the Ukraine but there are some that back up the you know Putin all the way mm-hmm. and you listen no to question what, and you listen to what they are that they the, the reasons they give for that and you think well, this is this is fed off of disinformation <laughs> so yeah there are people that manipulate there are groups of people that manipulate but is there a super secret secret society that controls 
everything. Do, well, do, 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 I, don't do, do. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, listeners? So I think now is a good time to lead us into Jack's segment. Okay, so well, I'm I looking forward to listen to this. Let him explain all about his secret society. Go for it. Jack, what secret society have you chosen to discuss? Well, I've chosen to talk about Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove. <laughs> Bohemian Grove, not Bohemian Grove. Oh, I'm just thinking of Queen. <laughs> Bohem- yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, so, do you want to talk a little bit about Bohemian Grove? Sure. <laughs> it's I'm actually kind slightly of apprehensive. It's kind of more of like a, a club, I guess, but it is also classed as a secret society. Okay. Um, so, a little bit of sort of scene setting. <laughs> Bohemian Grove is a restricted 2,700-acre campground at 20601 Bohemian Avenue in San Francisco, I believe. Okay. In mid-July each year, Bohemian Grove hosts a more than two-week encampment of some of the most prominent men in the world. Oh, so it kind of sounds fairly normal. Is it like a big, <laughs> big, camp, a big camp out or something? Mm, kind of, but... Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds nice, but... <laughs> The Bohemian Club's all-male membership includes artists and musicians, as well as many prominent business leaders, government officials, former US presidents, senior media executives, and people of power. Okay, so this is kind of like your high-ranking yeah, people. Yeah, the, the big dogs. The big dogs. But male only, which is kind of... Honestly, these, <laughs> these days? Not allowed. Members may invite guests to the Grove. Guests may be invited to the Grove for either the Spring Jinx in June or the main July encampment. Bohemian Club members can schedule private day use events at the Grove at any time it is not being used for club-wide purposes. I'm really interested to find out what this is about now. (laughs) They are allowed uh, at these times to bring spouses, family and friends, although female and minor guests must be off the property by 9 or (laughs) 10pm. Why? (laughs) I don't know, I'm not part of the club. (laughs) Okay, hopefully we can find out. Um... So that was kind of setting the the scene. Right. This is a little. This is an article I found that's just a little bit more about the actual secret society in quotation marks. Mm-hmm. Uh, many secret societies identify themselves as elite. Uh, they exclusively recruit wealthy and powerful men who are given a chance to meet similarly rich and influential fellows. With some prominent members like Henry Kissinger and President Ronald Reagan and George Bush, one of the elite secret societies is the Bohemian Club. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so far, so good. It doesn't seem particularly, like, out there. Not really. It's, it's just, yeah. It seems it's, fairly lighthearted and nice, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. It's, 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 if you look at it from, like, a society perspective, it's yeah. a bit weird that all of these kind of very rich people I'm are kind of, meeting in one place yeah. to kind of... Weird, yeah. <laughs> from, from an onlooker's perspective, it's kind of suspicious. Or just... That... just not going to get too political, but from where we are as a people, yeah, kind of lower ranks, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, mm-hmm. it's a bit weird. It is a bit weird. So in 1872, the officers of the San Francisco Chronicle witnessed the emergence of a secret society called the Bohemian Club. At that time, Bohemian was a term used to refer to a wandering reporter. It was used to name the club because at first all members were newspaper men. The club's honorary members included painters and writers, but after a short time, it initiated wealthy businessmen because it was appealing to them for its reputation and exclusiveness. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of waiting for like a big twist at some point. It's not. Uh, it, it doesn't seem I, too I, out there. I find this weird. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> just yeah, looking at it like, yeah, it's weird. Although artists and journalists remained in the club, CEOs and politicians were dominant by the beginning of the 20th century. The club's emblem was an owl, and its motto was, Weaving spiders come not here. Oh, what does that mean? It uh, was a quote from A Midsummer Night's Dream that meant bringing work into the club was not allowed. Oh, so it's like fairly chilled. (laughs) Fairly chill out. I I find it weird that you find this this so normal. It doesn't seem that bad, to be honest. You're You're not uncomfortable with the fact that all of the rich people in the world are meeting at this one place. I mean, does what, what could they be doing? Eye, have you seen Eyes Wide Shut? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to be like that, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that film freaked that. me out. <laughs> that film freaked me out. Um, that's what I'm saying. Post-podcast, I'm going to have to watch that. The Bohemians possibly chose their emblem based on a secret society called 
Schlarafrafia. That's, that's <laughs> you, the pronunciation. Can you pronounce that? Schlarafrafia. So it's S C H L A R A F F I A. Schlarafia. Schlarafia. A German order founded in Bohemia around 1859. Hmm. The Germans who immigrated to the US took it to San Francisco. Artists, actors, and musicians were the primary members of Schlarafrafia. <laughs> which close, which chose the owl of Bohemia as its totem, and parodied Masonic rituals. Mm. That's kind Still of like... not finding this weird. No, it doesn't oh seem too well. The rituals kind of sound a bit more interesting. Now you're saying it. Both the Bohemian Club and Sharafiara focused on having fun, so it would be safe to assume that the Bohemians were initially the American versions of Sharafiara. So this oh, German. So, so it has kind of had like a history, kind of, of like yeah. coming over from. Germany and then kind of being incorporated into it's like the American spin off of this German <laughs> cult thing. But what what were they actually getting up to? Do you know? Um, well, there's a little bit more about the kind of uh, origins. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a, another possibility about the origin of the Bohemian Club. <laughs> there was another occult secret society called the Sath Bar in Prague, also known as Asiatic Brethren. It had a combination of Jewish Kabbalah, alchemy, and ritual magic. Do you not find this weird that there's it's like... Pretty, it's kind of kind of more interesting now. <laughs> to start off with, it sounded like fairly okay. It's like a camp out of a weekend yeah, or but, something. But No, think about it. This is very rich, powerful people. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that Fine, just says something about me. We're not on me. the same wave here. Okay. Um, just like any other secret society with crossover in membership in different orders, Sath Bar members belonged to... Sharala Valafia simultaneously. I'm just trying to stay... So again, it's kind of like yeah. the same weird occult thing that's kind of popping up in different countries. Multiple origin stories right there. So it is plausible that the Bohemian Club borrowed principles and rituals form both these societies. As Bohemian Club evolved in its rituals over time, during the 1920s, the owl statue emerged at the cremation of care appeared later. Do you want to know about the cremation of care? Yeah, um, well, <laughs> that sounds a bit dark. So, as long as it's not like the Wicker Man or something. So, okay, I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine. What? what? <laughs> You're not finding this weird. It, it doesn't sound too bad. Okay. In comparison to what I've researched. So the cremation of care would be a normal thing for you at this point. Who's care? The cremation of care is a ritual involving the gathering of men with elaborate robes at the base of a 40-foot stone owl. Right. They okay. A, they put a human-shaped figure made of wicker on an altar and set it on fire. Now, this is Wicker Man style. Music, oh, and, dear. music and chanting follow. Dark turn. It is the opening ceremony of the annual summer retreat in the Bohemian Grove that takes three weeks with around 2,000 men present. Okay, so now we've kind of hit that <laughs> kind of stage where the plot has thickened and but it's become like, a lot more kind of freaky. These are like former presidents of the United States. Rich, powerful celebrities, possibly artists, maybe even like... So people of like quite high influence, yes, almost. The, and the highest influence. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and... They're getting kind of in this group and performing these kind of ancient rituals. Rituals now. At the base of a stone owl, <laughs> burning wicked men. Wow! Now, now my mind has just exploded <laughs> with that information. I'm like, I thought this was just like some kind of regular camp out, but no. Oh, yeah, sure. You think I'd bring that to the table? <laughs> but wow, that that has suddenly gone we probably next dis- level. A disclaimer that we have nothing against these secret societies. Please don't kill yep. us off. If the Now We Know show suddenly disappears, <laughs> it may have been because of this episode. <laughs> I'm waiting for the invite, to be honest, but yeah, <gasps> that's just me. The ritual appears to be a mock human sacrifice, which has led some people to believe that it is a pagan cult in the form of a men's club. I mean, that's that's pretty like on, on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would presume anyway. Some adherents to conspiracy theories... Um, believe it is a remnant of the cult of Moloch, M-O-L-O-C-H. Moloch was a god to whom people sacrificed children by burning them. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) Oh, my God. Um, How? How is it even allowed for them to kind of do this? Because they're rich and powerful people. So so. they're the the people in charge. They can do whatever they want. Just open your mind. Look at the bigger picture. Look how small we are. Look how tiny we are in terms of, like, the, the global society. influence <laughs> but we are literally nothing these people are like the most powerful people in the world 
They run it the world. It does kind of sound a bit kind of odd. And they're doing they? this weird ritual of burning things to sacrifice to pagan gods. <laughs> Ooh. These are the people in charge of everything. Oh no. <laughs> kind of brings that a new look. Kind of how you live. <laughs> we have officially become a conspiracy theory. Oh podcast. no. <laughs> um, we are very ill-informed, by the way. We don't know anything about any of the things that go on in, in these <laughs> circles. And I don't want to get involved. Unless you're willing to pay me loads of money. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this cult was called the Ancient Canatine, Canaanite, Luciferian, and Babylonian Mystery Religion. Wow. But the Bohemian Grove members insist that their ceremonies are merely for fun, dismissing any connection to Moloch, worshipping, or Druid rites, or Bavarian Illuminati. So it's fine. Oh, you know, they're well, just saying it's well, a load of fun. If they're saying it's okay, then we must take their word for it. Yeah, I mean, these people are like <laughs> has, really influential. Really has, rich. has anyone who's not part of these societies actually observed this happening? There are, I think, there are photos. I've right. seen photos. We have seen photos. It tends to take place in like a forest. Has the person disappeared afterwards? <laughs> because it'd be really interesting to kind of I'm scared, Zach. meet or <laughs> interview someone who has actually seen this kind of act being performed. Yeah, well, it's just exclusive for rich people, so you you know we're not going to get there. And so. hopefully, we won't disappear. No. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the these are rich people. Zach. It's mad. It's slightly mad. These, like, these could be like really famous musicians that people like really love, or like actors. They could be like really famous actors. I know. That's... And former presidents of the United States is like confirmed. Could, be, could it kind of be anyone like from popular media or anything? Yes, exactly. That's that's kind of frightening to kind of picture. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Prominent members of the club. After 1930, membership and rituals became more exclusive, which is attributed to the influence of Herbert Hoover, the then president of the US. Wow. <laughs> so that was the guy who was in charge of the United States of America. Yeah. <laughs> and he was part of this <laughs> the influence oh of president God. herbert hoover made recruitment to the bohemian club more exclusive so one of the former presidents of the united states you know just like, like literally one of the most powerful people in the world yeah you've got to be millionaires that's all right like, he just put then yeah he put the membership price up a little bit <laughs> billionaires yeah <laughs> <laughs> other prominent members of the club included henry luce the publisher and david rockefeller uh, walt disney visited the club as a guest in no. 1936 oh no which inspired parts of his 1937 animation, Snow White, especially the scoring scene. Ooh. Ooh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's dark. That's really dark now. Uh, Richard Nixon was another... What? Guest another president? ...who asked to give a lakeside talk to the Grove in 1967. This visit was so inspiring for him that he mentioned it as the first milestone on my road to the presidency. Oh my god, so this was before he was president? Apparently so. And, like... So he's gone to this club. He's of like gone to the club really, of billionaires. Yeah. Had a, done a talk. He's done a little team talk. He's like, guys, look, I think I'm going to be a good president. You've got all the money. You've got all the power. Just, just fund my... Just make it happen. ...application. Do, yeah. they, do they apply to be president? I don't know how. They kind of have camp, fun <laughs> campaigns, very, don't they? Very ill-informed. Um, but yeah, something... Something's and he mysteriously became president. And then all the news stations are like, oh, look, he's won the most votes. Like, that actually means anything. Ooh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. A recorded phone conversation reveals another opinion of Nixon about the Grove. He said that the Grove festivities were the most effing goddamn thing you could imagine. Imagine. I think that's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining something from like, do you remember when we watched The Devil Rides Out? Yeah. And then they did this kind of ritual in a forest and then Satan basically appeared. <laughs> well, yeah. And I know you, you said earlier you haven't seen Eyes Wide Shut. Mm. And we know, even on this podcast, we've we've spoken about it, that we think Kubrick kind of knew things that yeah. lots of people didn't know. There's a lot of theories about Eyes Wide Shut that Kubrick was trying to tell us that these things happen in real life and right. we should kind of be a bit wary of them. And that film, Eyes Wide Shut, gave me a really like uneasy feeling. Oh no, I really have to go watch this It now. was the last film he made. He died before it actually was... Released. Finished. Yeah. So they, someone else kind of like... Took, took the reins. Edited it. I think the majority of it was kind of edited by someone else. So there's a good kind of... Oh, no. Oh, no. This didn't have anything to do with his death, did it? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not saying We're really I'm going into saying, the conspiracies now. I'm just saying oh. the two things kind of 
Wow. Add up, okay. You know? Well, that's definitely a flashback to He's our exposing this big... other Kubrick episode when He's we're exp... doing about the moon landings. Yeah, I bring it back to Kubrick all the time. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm just saying, you know, he exposed or attempted to expose this. Exclusive oh no. club people oh no. that do naughty things. We're coming up with theories now. And yeah, he wasn't wasn't around for much longer after that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as you were saying, the Bohemian Club. Um, although the influence of the Bohemian Club might be blown out of proportion, it does seem to have some reality to it. People who share similar interests gather in secret societies and turn them into a source of different activities like insider trading and even revolutions. When powerful and wealthy men join these societies, their activities even get more unpredictable. They do bring their work and trade inside the society, no matter if it is allowed or not. Many societies Ooh. intersect with each other with shared members in various orders. Oh no, so there's kind of like a wider branching network of secret yeah. societies as, that are all linked together. As as far as I got with my research and then my phone kind of just stopped working for some reason. Oh no. <laughs> just like shut down and I got like a weird like red circle on my screen. You're, you've been targeted for... Yeah assassination um <laughs> hopefully not we do enjoy having you on the podcast <laughs> so yeah that's that's bohemian club oh wow at the bohemian like, grove initially when you started off it didn't seem too bad and then you went <laughs> into the nitty-gritty stuff mm. talking about rituals and kind of this high-ranking kind of network of people that are kind yeah. of get, gaining almost it kind of feels like you're gaining influence and kind of yeah, control yeah, we're, we're just the this. pieces on the chessboard. They're just with the pawns. Yeah, we're just. Oh no. Yeah, there's, we've no power. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of frightening to think about because, but this is in America. This is in America. Predominantly, yes, but it would seem that, as we said with like the German one and the Portuguese, whatever it was, Prague or something. Yeah. That these things kind of pop up over, kind over the place. Branches out into a further network spanning but, the world. Yeah, but America is is one of, if not the superpower of the world. So, yeah. You know. If it's going to be anywhere. Scary, scary thoughts. If it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be the US. So, so there we have it. We've had yeah. Bohemian, what was it? Bohemian Club. Bohemian Club. Kind of a, I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Well, thank you very much for sharing all that <laughs> information about <laughs> that. It's no, we been can't, we can't release this. <laughs> it's been lovely to have you on the podcast again, Jack. Oh, this might be my last time. Oh, no, hopefully not. So thank you very much, Jack, for explaining what the Bohemian Club was. And it was kind of this idea that all the high ups in American society kind of grouped together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is kind of what I was saying. Kind of what, were, what you were saying, yeah, You Buzz. will get people clubbed together. And they Grouped were performing together. these kind of ancient kind of... What's the word? Rituals. Rituals. What were the pagan rituals. Pagan rituals, okay. Yeah, and it was kind of very Wicker Man. I did kind of <laughs> jest at the beginning, is there going to be a sudden twist is this going to be like the Wicker Man? And it turned out, yes, it was. Mm. But one thing that did kind of stem from that conversation I had with Jack was the idea that there isn't just one secret society. It's kind of like a web of intersecting secret societies. That's what was presented. It was kind of this kind of strange idea that there's no one singular controlling thing, which is kind of what was presented so you in your conversation secrecy, about in, in, the Illuminati. So in that case, do you think that with uh, secret societies interacting with each other in this web, mm. is that in a cooperative way or against the other secret societies? I think it was in a co- cooperative, cooperative way. way. But that uh, then leads me to say, well, if you've got these secret societies, are they uh, more country-based? And by, by what I mean is, you know, if you've got secret societies that are... Uh, across say, the USA, North yeah. America, before the issue with the Ukraine, would they be interacting with secret societies in Russia, for example? And then this is the this current conflict situation occurs, and they break off ties. Or, you know, or do they? Are, 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 are these secret societies kind of you know uh, just literally kind of based in their own world? World, or and, are they kind of? reflecting or influencing the world like yeah, why, the road around you know, them is this why maybe uh you know one country would feel that when you've got a collaborative group of countries that are <laughs> all in one club like the the united nations yeah. uh and uh, that they would want to influence the ones that aren't that it's, it's very interesting because what i have found from this secret yeah, society's like, like episode and nato yeah you know, they, they're really is, against nato a lot of it is posing questions mm-hmm. But no, there's no definitive answer as to what really 
is there something or isn't there? That's yeah. the thing. But that's that's that goes back to that discordianism in the sixties by presenting lots and lots of information, which can technically be absolute bully, <laughs> and then arguing against that bully, yeah, and then adding more bully, it becomes so confusing. It's so convoluted for a lot of you know for all those people that aren't directly maybe involved in sorting out a situation or dealing with certain areas of life in general yeah. then it be, you know people will can be very 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 misled yes hmm. it's very worrying isn't exactly. it that but they, but then again you don't want to be you don't want to you never want to be the person who feels you've been misled to only find that the people you've been following that have been feeding that information have actually done it. By the way, we've only done it so you would do this. Yeah, so you would do it for us. To get our way. Yeah, to get our way. You know, you have brought down a government so we can take charge. <laughs> and be worse. And be worse. <laughs> because you think we're wonderful. <laughs> yeah. See, you never know. Okay, so that brings me on to our third, our third secret, secret society, society of this particular episode. Because yeah, we've got a few to go over, really. Yes. <laughs> we'll come back on this subject. So, I have researched <laughs> Skull and Bones. Skull, I've never heard of that. Is that a secret society? It is, it is. I'll go into it. Skull and Bones, Skull and also known as the Order... Order 322, or the Brotherhood of Death, <laughs> the Brotherhood of Death, <laughs> is an undergraduate senior secret student society at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Right, okay. The oldest senior class society at the university, Skull and Bones, has become a cultural institution known for its powerful alumni and various conspiracy theories. It is one of the big three societies at Yale. The other two being... Scroll and Key, and Wolf's Head. Right. Mm. You see, it's that kind of stuff that would make uh, your everyday, um, uh, you know, man, man and woman in the street to look at those and think they are really, you know, they're, they're, they're so separated from that kind of... Yeah. Uh, social... Yeah, they're so up themselves. Ladder, you yeah. know? Anyway, carry on. The Society's alumni organisation, the Russell Trust Association, owns the organisation's real estate and oversees the membership. The Society is known informally as Bones, and the members are known as Bonesmen, members of the Order, or initiated to the Order. Right, so they actually, when you say real estate, they own property, yes. land. Yes, yes they do. I'll, I will get into that. Okay. A little bit about the history of Skull and mm -hmm. Bones now. Skull and Bones was founded in 1832 after a dispute among Yale debating societies, I believe I'm pronouncing this right, Leonia, Brothers in Unity, and the Calliopean Society over that season's Phi Beta Kappa Awards. Wow. Okay, that's a, <laughs> certainly a mouthful though. William Huntington Russell and Alfonso Taft co-founded the Order of the Skull and Bones. The first senior members included Russell, Taft, and 12 other members. Alternative names for Skull and Bones are, as formerly mentioned, the Order, Order 322, and the Brotherhood of Death. Right. So what do they actually get up to that we're going to discover? Well, the Society's assets are managed by its alumni organisation, the Russell Trust Association, incorporated in 1856, and named after the Bones co-founder, the association was founded by Russell and Daniel Coit Gilman, a Skull and Bonesman member. Right. The first extended description of Skull and Bones published in 1871 by Lyman Bagg in his book Four Years at Yale noted that the mystery now attending its existence forms the one great enigma which college gossip never tries tires of discussing. Right, so... It's this society which is... Brooks Mather Kelly attributed the interest in Yale senior societies to the fact that underclassmen members of then freshman, sophomore and junior class societies returned to campus the following years and could share information about society rituals while graduating seniors were, with their knowledge of such, at least a step removed from campus life. So uh, it all seems... It kind of seems a very, very long um, leap away from our lives here in the UK. Yeah. I mean, I'm an alumni 
from where I've studied, and you're an alumni from where you've been. Well, that was the thing. University. I, I feel but, like this is kind of. But you hear a lot about this Kappa Lambda Gamma Delta, and it just kind of, of it, and it goes straight, straight over, over our, our heads, heads in the UK. Um, they do seem to like their fraternity or frat clubs, don't they? Yeah, it does seem to be. Skull and Bones selects new members among students every spring as part of Yale University's Tap Day, and has done so since 1879. Since the society's inclusion of women in the early 1990s, Skull and Bones selects 15 men and women of the junior class to join the society. Skull and Bones taps those that it views as campus leaders and other notable figures for its membership. Okay, so do you think that these things end up going down the line that once you've left these, uh, you know, you've left the um, the realms of your college, you know, you're out into the real world, yeah, and you've got to work. That then it's the you scratch my back, I scratch yours. I believe it's kind of starting that almost be, because yeah, you're you're a, you're a nod nod wink wink. You were in the club. <laughs> so to speak. It does seem to be a step removed from previous secret societies we've actually talked about. With the Illuminati, it's very much that big kind of global thing. Yes, controlling Whereas everything. Jack's was the fact that it was kind of the high ups in Government. American society. Right. Whereas this seems to be kind of almost leading into that. Right. Just like These are your first steps at getting First steps in into a secret, secret society. society. So it's a very interesting kind of right. cross-examination, isn't it? Yeah. Now, the number 322 appears in Skull and Bones insignia and is widely reported to be significant as the year of Greek orator Demosthenes death. I think I said that right. Okay, I have no idea. <laughs> just take it. Just I'll take it. It was a Greek philosopher. <laughs> a letter. Orator, sorry. <laughs> a letter between early society members in Yale archives suggests that 322 is a reference to the year 322 BCE and that members measure dates from this year instead of from the common era. In 322 BC, the Lamian War ended with the death of the Greek orator, I'm not saying that word again, <laughs> and Athenians were made to dissolve their government and establish a plutocratic system in its stead. Oh, right. Have you heard of plutocratic? Plutocratic. <laughs> I have now. Whereby only those possessing 2,000 drachms or more could remain citizens. Documents in the tomb have purportedly been found dated to Anno Demothesini members okay. <laughs> measure time of day according to a clock five minutes out of sync with normal time. Seems the latter is called barbarian time. Oh I love that. I tell you, it <laughs> seems awfully convoluted. Yes, it does. In order to try and make people feel separated and obviously referring to the rest of us as barbarian time. Oh, I which quite means, like that. Means that like equates that. us to being barbarians. Therefore, People are, are really trying to make sure that they are separate, yeah. separate in their own society. Yeah, you kind of want from, to separate. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's what, that's what causes people to feel that there is in society elitism. This does seem to kind of be separate from the other societies we've talked about because it kind of is that separation. It doesn't seem to be that much of a controlling element as well, the other ones. No, this what you've said so far just strikes me as being a a very, very complicated and convoluted <laughs> society of, um, I don't know, intellectuals. I don't know how they choose their membership. Um, perhaps it goes on if they can find the members who then go on to being influential in government and in uh, you know, certain circles and mm. sciences and things. Maybe that they can you know, do their secret handshake, wink, wink, nod, nod, and all this. <laughs> and, uh, and in some ways, this can be beneficial to them or whether they are meant to lead into other, you know, societies, uh, uh, you know, like, like a chain further up the line, you know, mm. that somehow you can manipulate the way the world works. I, yeah. don't, I don't know. But it just, just strikes me that what you're telling me is very much how I would... Uh, if I'd done the Masons, I don't know a little bit about the Masons, but and I've worked, I mentioned this in a previous podcast, I worked at a Masons uh, a Masonic Lodge uh, doing a few things. I've met lots of Masons, and as far as I'm concerned, the Masons just seem to be more of a kind of a, a philanthropist type of organisation that they yeah. try and help and 
you know, and do things. But yeah, there is a little bit of you scratch my back, I scratch yours. But so far, I'm not seeing or I'm not feeling that there are some kind of mystic high order like yeah. the Illuminati, if you know what I mean. One legend is the numbers in the Society's emblem 3T2 represent founded in 32, second corpse, referring to a first corpse in an unknown German university. Again, sounds so convolutedly complicated. I know, and that's just one, that's, that's kind of like a theory of where it came from. Yeah, but again, we're talking about theories. <laughs> this, this is the, just spreading again more bizarre, probably disinformation or, or theories, conspiracy theories, mm. to, from people who are trying to infiltrate or maybe understand what's going on in these secrets. So I, oh, it all sounds a bit... No. What, what, do we actually know what the skull bones do? Uh, I mean, because obviously so it seems far, to be something. No, it just. It seems to be if you go to Yale University, everybody's heard of the skull and bones. Everybody knows that it's not very there. secret, is it? It's not very secret. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I think I think we're lacking being, you know, British, being English. Maybe we're lacking the understanding of how this system of American university type. Uh, organizations organizations the 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 clubs yeah how that yeah. how does that function yeah how yeah you know, how they function because they you hear about these different fraternities and they they i mean they always name them by greek letters and everything else in the uk what have we really got to actually understand them we've got what a few films yeah just to kind of get a, a general yeah. idea oh films you know, now you're talking <laughs> you know now, now you're talking the you know everything's got to be right because it's a movie you know? <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, it's, it's got to be the truth if it's a movie. <laughs> so, you may have noticed that I mentioned yep. the tomb. The Skull and Bones Hall is otherwise known as the tomb. tomb. The, tomb, the, bef tomb. <laughs> the tomb before the addition of a second wing, the building was built in three phases. Okay. The first wing was built in 1856, the second was built in 1903, and Davis designed neo-Gothic towers were added to the rear garden in 1912. The front and side facades are of Portland brownstone in an Egypto-Doric style. Right, so that's kind of uh, Illuminati. -ish. Yeah. The 1912 tower additions created a small enclosed courtyard in the rear of the building designed by Evarts Tracy and Everton Sortwout. Sortwout, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Everton Sortwout. Of Tracy and Sortwout. Tracy New and Sortwout. New York. Evarts Tracy and an 1819 Bonesman and his parental grandmother Martha Sherman Everarts and maternal grandmother Mary Everarts were the sisters of William Maxwell Everarts and 1837 Bonesman. Right. <laughs> so they've they've extended their tomb building. Yes. A 2009 view of the tomb from across High Street. The architect was possibly Alexander Jackson Davis or Henry Austin. Architectural historian Patrick Pinnell includes an in-depth discussion of the dispute over the identity of the original architect in his 1999 Yale campus history. Pinnell speculates that a reuse of the Davis Towers in 1911 suggests Davis's role in the original building and Conversely, Austin was responsible for the architecturally similar brownstone Egyptian revival Grove Street Cemetery Gates, built in 1845. Well, Whew. I don't want to sound like a barbarian, but uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of this it sounds very convoluted, but it's uh, unless you're really interested in... Uh... What? Architecture. <laughs> I have done a lot of research on you this. You certainly have. I certainly have. have. You've really, <laughs> you've, you've dug, dug down to the bones you have on this one. Funnily enough. Pinnell also discusses the tomb's aesthetic place in relation to its neighbours, including the Yale University Art Gallery. In the late 1990s, New Hampshire landscape architects Saucier and Flynn designed the wrought iron fence that surrounds a portion of the complex. Right. So we know we have the skull and bones. We know they're at Yale. We know that they spend their money and influence uh, building their, their tomb. Yep. Uh, we don't know really what, what influence they do. on society they may have. Yeah. But I don't, they don't seem that secret. No. That you know, does it's, seem it's to be like, thing. It's like if the Illuminati were to be a real thing, you want to know where their headquarters are. 
mm -hmm. you know, sort of inner chamber down below the pyramids of Giza, hidden away, maybe under the Sphinx or something, mm -hmm. you know. But to say, yeah, there's our building, it's the tomb, it's just across the road. <laughs> now, interestingly enough, they do also have their own island. Well, part of the real estate. <laughs> Deer Island. Deer Island. I've got a long section about it, but I think I'm going to skip over okay. that. Bonesman. Bonesman. Skull and Bones membership developed a reputation in association with the power elite. Right, oh. so now we get somewhere. Regarding the qualifications of membership, Lanny Davis wrote in the 1968 Yale yearbook, if the society had a good year, this is what the ideal group will consist of. A football captain, a chairman of the Yale Daily News, a conspicuous radical, a whiff and poof, with and poof. <laughs> a um. swimming captain, a notorious drunk with a 94 average, a filmmaker, a political columnist, a religious group leader, a chairman of the lit, a foreigner, a ladies' man with two motorcycles, <laughs> an ex-serviceman, if there are enough to go around, a guy nobody else in the group had ever heard of, ever. It sounds like just uh, it's a very the, the, very the, diverse yeah. uh, cross section of people. That's there. from the uh, Lanny Davis, quoted by Alexandra Robbins, George W. Knight of Eulogia. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. I think if I if I was living in America and I went to Yale, I think I'd uh, be so busy with my studies that would be more than I would have want to take on board. Yeah, definitely. To be part definitely. Of the, uh, Skull and Bonesmen. Like other Yale senior societies, Skull and Bones membership was almost exclusively limited to white Protestant males for much of its history. Right. While Yale itself has exclusionary policies directed at particular ethnic and religious groups, the senior societies were even more exclusionary. While some Catholics were able to join such groups, Jews were more often not. Some of these excluded groups eventually entered Skull and Bones by means of sports through the society's practice of tapping standout athletes. Star football players tapped for Skull and Bones included the first Jewish player, Al Hesberg, class of 1938, and African-American player, Levi Jackson, class of 1950, who turned down the invitation for the Berzelius Society. Right. So if you're a member of the society, you're called a boneman. A bonesman, yeah. I just call them boners. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really think, out, think that one out, did they? No, they didn't. Did didn't. Say, oh, you're not one of them boners, are you? <laughs> Members are assigned nicknames. Okay, okay, well, nicknames are not bad. Long Devil, the tallest member, Bose, a varsity football captain, or Sharif, Prince of the Future. <laughs> sure. I want to be Sharif, Prince of the Future! <laughs> Many of the chosen names are drawn from literature, Hamlet, uh, Uncle Remus, religion and myth. I was going to say, it sounded like some names from... Uh... Uh, what's, what's it? What's it? Morty. Brick and Morty. Brick and Morty. Um, yes. The banker Louis Lapham passed on his nickname Sancho Panza to, <laughs> it's definitely Brick and to Morty. the political advisor Tex McCarthy. Avril Harriman was Thor. Henry Luce was Bow. McGeorge Bundy was Odin, and George H. W. Bush was Magog. 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 Magog yeah. Oh dear. Ill use of. Uh... Of, of the Norse gods' names there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I agree with that at all, sir. No. No, stick to your Rick and Morty names. I am Mr... What's his name in Rick and Morty? Poopy Butthole. No, no, no. The one from the sea. Mr Nimbus. Uh, hey, Mr Nimbus. They, they need a Mr Nimbus in their society, <laughs> don't they? Like, you can just imagine him coming out. I am Mr Nimbus. Well, I don't know how up to date this is, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. They might have a Mr Nimbus. Crooking. What am I saying? Crooking. You're crooking. Would you like to know what crooking is? Yeah, they do something. They do crooking in the society. Skull and Bones has a reputation for stealing keepsakes from other Yale societies. Uh, I have heard, I've, I've heard of this stuff going on before. Or from campus buildings. Okay. Society members reportedly call the practice crooking and strive to outdo each other's crooks. Right. Well, okay. The society has been accused of possessing the stolen skulls of Martin Van Bruun, Geronimo, and Pancho Villa. Yeah, see, that's funny. You you just throw in, uh, back, you know, memories of mine from watching films. Funny enough, the yeah. the uh, obviously the 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 uh, library of all that is true in the world films. Um, I'm joking there, <laughs> and um, 
uh, there used to be things like I think there was an old film Frat House and things and there's, but there's several I'm sure they, there's an American well, Pie with all these well, they houses they're trying in. to steal it's Beta House uh, isn't yeah, it they're going to try and steal other people's um, mascots mm. I'm sure there's one that comes to mind where they stole some goat and another one where it was uh, an eagle or a, or something that they'd stolen I don't know there seems to be a lot of this goes on yeah and um, over here in the UK it just kind of when you were at university what did you do what, what secret societies were there uh, at the university? If there were any, I was not they a party. They were really secret. <laughs> they were very secret because <laughs> I didn't know secret. about them. You didn't sort of like walk the halls and say, I wonder why there is a goat walking around with a special waistcoat on. Or I mean, there are, there are a few odd things that come to mind. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had, they'd had get-togethers and things, but they were very very public okay. get-togethers and things. Okay, so no, uh, no secret no, societies. I'd just go to university do the classes I had on the day. Yeah, do your lectures. Do my lectures. Do what needs doing. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's like you've passed us both by. Or... Conspiracy theories. Okay, go for it. The group Skull and Bones is featured in books and movies which claim that the society plays a role in a global conspiracy for oh. world control. Oh, back to the levels of the Illuminati at last. There have been rumours that Skull and Bones is a branch of the Illuminati. Aha, uh-huh. there we're getting somewhere. Having been founded by German university alumni right. following the order's suppression in their native land by Karl Theodore, Elector of Bavaria. Aha, so the Bavarian Illuminati. With the support of Frederick the Great of Prussia. Right, we have a connection to the Bavarian Illuminati. Or that the <laughs> Skull and Bones <laughs> itself controls the CIA. Oh. <laughs> I think that's a bit far-fetched. They were controlled by the Masons. I think that's a bit devious. <laughs> and they're all hiding the fact that the Earth is flat. But it's interesting, though. Again, it kind of brings that back to that idea that Jack and I were talking about that it was kind of this web uh-huh. of secret societies interlocking with each other to kind of create this kind of facade that it's all one big thing. Yeah, I think if you just strip... if Honestly, I get this feeling that if you strip away the, the secret society mystique, that it's just lots of people who happen to either have vast wealth or certain positions in society... You know, I don't know if necessarily, you know, somebody uh, wakes up or, you know, as a child and, and then has no idea that somewhere down the line they're going to become president of the United States. Yeah. Or whether it's uh, people um, that that it's already pre-planned for them to take these positions because people are opening doors for them along the way, mm. you know, because of their... Families, it's all this very convoluted stuff, isn't it? Stuff. But ultimately, I, if you strip away, as I say, strip away the, the mystique part, then I have no doubt that there are groups of people in this world through both wealth and influence that do know each other and sort of try and manipulate things, perhaps. For their, probably more than anything, it's probably people try and manipulate things in the world for their own benefit. Hmm than to try and control the overall, you know, okay, we want to ultimately have the whole populace living in small, uh, you know, uh, pods. Yeah. And they all wake up in the morning, all trudge off all wearing the same uniform, go to work, are glad that they've got work to do, that they, therefore, they get all get the same... They all get, everybody has the same, they all have the same money, the same health care, they've got somewhere to live, they rent everything. So you rent, you know, if you've got a vehicle, you, you lease your vehicle, you rent where you live, you stream your services, everything. So you, the, the, the adage of, of the old um, Great Reset, that you own nothing, but you are happy, mm. that, that, it's that, that there is some kind of, if, if you had like a balcony, that there's a, a big group of people that could be standing on that balcony overlooking everybody just doing this robotic kind of lifestyle and when one person in that society or two people or three people suddenly scratch their heads and go yeah should i be doing it this way (laughs) that they suddenly shove sports and football type of things in their way something else for them to to redirect focus their thoughts, on, to focus yeah. on to disguise actually that they're being manipulated <laughs> right and center you know something else you know um it, i find it hard to think that there's that balcony of people overlooking everybody in the world thinking 
we need to control society and to take, yeah, to, take to, them in a certain direction. Yeah, yeah what, I to think what that, end? To I, what end would that be? Well, I think that people aren't quite as focused to say, I want to make society be like that. Because ultimately, if you're at the top of society, it's more like, well, what can I get out of it? You know, when I wake up today, am I going to be going and eating caviar with somebody else and going off on their luxury yacht mm. or shooting off on the next moon rocket to play snooker in the new moon base or something with, with my you know ultra billionaire buddies? Um, I think people, humans, tend to be more interested in what they get out of something. Yeah, the self. The self, rather than actually trying to manipulate things for the many. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm probably completely wrong, but, <laughs> but yeah, it. maybe there are groups out there that want to kind of manipulate the world. I mean, certain societies, yeah, you, when you've got, say, uh, a government in control that wants to keep the people oppressed and keep the people under control and keep the people so they don't revolt, yeah, it's mm. usually why the primary reason is because they don't want to be overthrown because they're sitting in a place of power and behind their high walls and closed doors, they're eating caviar and drinking champagne yeah. while everybody else is you know, yeah. having a loaf of bread and a, a thankful of a cup of water. Mm. Yeah, The only reason they don't want the populace to rise up is because they'll lose what, they what they've got. So ergo, at the, end of, at the end of the day, they're not doing whatever they do for the benefit of controlling the populace for the benefit of the populace. They want to just hang on to Protect what yeah. they've got and probably always have an exit strategy that if it all goes to pot they've got all sorts of offshore bank accounts of god knows where and they've got an island in the middle of deer island, they, deer yeah. island that they can bugger <laughs> off to so yeah uh, an all controlling society that controls and manipulates everything behind mm. clothes I, I, I don't it's, know it's dubious it's dubious it's it's fanciful it's a fantastic idea to think that there are these things you know secrets and it's kind of almost mystical and magical and hidden hidden clues to things would you like to know a couple of the references in in fiction and popular media that skull, skull and bones, and bones. Yeah, yeah yes finish off with that yeah. let's finish up on that uh skull and bones has been satirized in a number of the doonesbury comic strips there are actually some films called the skulls skulls 2 and skulls 3 okay these are films these are films okay well maybe films. we should surrounding them Maybe Skull and Bone Society. Dig one out sometime and take a look. Yeah. Uh, in the film version of The Great Gatsby. Uh huh. In the. Do they get mentioned in that, do they? Uh, in Baz Luhrmann's film version of F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel The Great Gatsby, Nick Carraway calls Tom Buchanan Bose. Tom, in turn, calls Nick Shakespeare. Nick has said earlier that he met Tom at Yale. It is thereby implied that they were in the Skull and Bones together. Well, they, uh, from what you just said, did I get that right? That they were calling each other nicknames? Yeah. Uh, so they're the nicknames they would have had being members of the Skull and Bones. Yeah. In The Good Shepherd, the protagonist becomes a member of the Skull and Bones while studying at Yale. <laughs> These next ones are funny. So they've appeared in The Simpsons. Okay. <laughs> uh, Family Guy, mm -hmm. American Dad, and surprisingly, the Batman TV series. So, what you just read out lastly is uh, it sounds a lot more like a satirical uh, kind of what we'd say in the UK piss take of, of them. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Whereas usually where I see the Illuminati is always you know in the kind of Dan Brown novels and movies, Lara Croft. Uh, I think did they get touched upon with the with the all seeing eye and the pyramid in uh, National Treasure and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's they, all mystical and. Ultra secret. I think it was in, in un, what was it? Did in, the Illuminati also sort of you get Uncharted? Crossover. Was it in Uncharted? It was that game, but that was became a movie, didn't it? Yeah. Um, wasn't the best movie that I can remember. Um, but yeah, because they get, I'm sure they get interwoven with uh, things like the Templars, the Knights Templar, and things as well. So hmm, interesting stuff. There we are. Yeah, it's interesting the different levels we've kind of we've kind of gone from the big super idea of the Illuminati come down a notch to the high ups in American society that yeah. kind of supposedly influence control yeah, everything. You're, you're basically you're super wealthy. Yeah. yeah and uh, then down down a step before mm -hmm. going up to that, your university. Yeah. And then when you come to the people that 
aren't associated with secret societies, yeah. they're the ones that are always saying the secret societies. Yeah, they fuel that idea, they fuel, don't they? Yeah, and of course, there'll be people within the well, there'll be people within society that want to fuel that uh, kind of um, misinformation and discordia towards secret societies for the common man and woman to you know get their back up and to shake their fist at and yeah it's all because of them you know <laughs> uh yeah i mean there we go what what more can be said about the secret societies it's all theories and and ifs and buts isn't ifs it and buts, yeah but uh, we would like your free feedback the the people listening uh, obviously well our listeners if you've got any solid proof that you've come across that tells you the the Illuminati are real. Are you part of a secret society and are you willing to share with us? Yes, are you a member of the Skull and Bones? <laughs> no, really. <laughs> no, really. Shh, don't tell anybody. Or is this whole podcast trying to throw you off the mark? <laughs> <laughs> they don't exist, really. Yes, they don't. No, they don't. Yes, they don't. No, they don't. Stop it. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Now it's time Four. to... What are we... Oh, yeah! What are we... Hey, what are we... We're going to find out... What hugger mugger means? Hugger mugger. That's this is this is the thing I've been waiting all this time for. Now I'm going to cut in now. What Jack thinks hugger mugger is? Okay. Okay. So Jack, yes. you weren't here for the word of the week at the beginning of this episode. No. But the word of the week is it's one of my favourite segments. Hugger mugger. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas hugger what mugger. that means? You big hugger mugger. Um, yep. What's it mean? <laughs> yeah. Goddamn hugger mugger. Uh, hugger mugger. Didn't expect that one, did you? No. Oh, I think it is someone who hugs you against your will. <laughs> <laughs> but in like a loving way, not a creepy way, if that's a thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Someone who like surprise hugs you. A surprise hug. A surprise hug. We're going for a surprise hug. Okay. So, Buzz. Yep. What do you think hugger mugger means? Well, after our discussion about the uh, secret societies, I think it's a... Nickname for one of the Skull and Bones Bonesmen, or Boners as I like to call them. <laughs> it's the Hugger Mugger one. Right. No, I think Hugger Mugger. I think it's somebody who might sell you dodgy merchandise. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Hugger Mugger mm -hmm. is a fun way to describe secretive or covert behaviour. No, ah, right. Oh, yeah. He's been up to Hugger Mugger. So well done, listeners, if you correctly guessed what Hugger Mugger means. All right. Secret business <laughs> of the secret society. Shh. Sneaking around up to Hugger Mugger business. Covert secret things. Covert. Doesn't exist really. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. So that brings us on to the next teaser for Ooh, our teaser. next episode. Hooray. So I will leave you with the following statement. Go for it. Cheap as chips, camera, set, and action. Cheap as chips, camera, set, and action. Mm, what could that be? Any ideas? Comment below. Comment below. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe to this channel and comment below any suggestions of topics or activities you'd like to listen to in future episodes. You can find the Now We Know Show podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music and Apple Podcasts. Check out the Zach Wild Productions social media pages on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter or visit the Zach Wild Productions website at www.zachwildproductions.com. Please get in contact, we'd love to find out how you're listening to us. So get in touch in the comments and don't forget to check out Zach Wild Productions on Patreon to become an official ZWP patron today. That's a big skull and bones goodbye from Zach. And it's a very secretive... Covert. Covert. Hugger mugger goodbye from Buzz. And it's a pagan ritual goodbye from Jack. Hey! We don't condone any pagan or secret society rituals in any form. Now we know, now we know, now we know, show! Now we know, 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 now we know